member of the Esk Valley Community Energy Group. And we were set up about ooh, six, seven years ago, it's a long time, uh, with the help of the National Park and the Parish Council here. They were interested in setting up two or three groups throughout the National Park to aid um, energy conservation. And there's basically a group in the village hall were asked to get together and see who were interested in participating. And from that we developed, so we now have monthly meetings and uh, we had uh, a full-time officer, Vicky Shaw, helped us set up in the first place. But now we sort of run our own meetings, we've developed from there. So who are the we? Who are the kind of people who are giving up their time to get involved? Well, m mostly, well, they started off um, originally just in Danby Parish, but we've got people from, um, travel now from Whitby, Great Aden, um, Fryup, even right. next door. <laughs> no, Fryup, just, just in our parish. Um, but no, and people travel from Gavin Side as well to be part of the group. Basically, most of them are, are centred, the meetings are centred around Castleton Danby area, just because that's where we started. But we don't see ourselves as a Danby Castleton group. We feel that we want to be an Esk Valley group. That's how we think it should be, because the information we've got and what we'd like to achieve is applicable right down the valley. Mm -hmm. They're all the same um, kind of problems that occur. It mostly, um, it started off with no information at all. When we started off, we spent the first year or so just gathering information about what, what was necessary, um, what could be done in the area. So the obvious thing we thought, well, um, insulation is the basic. That's the way you start always. If you can insulate your property, then you're not wasting any energy. Right. So, right. so you reduce your energy consumption. Our basic uh, idea was to reduce the carbon footprint by whatever methods. So start with the insulation, and, that's what, and the, we still give advice on that. So how successful have you been with that sort of insulation campaign? Well, what we did with the insulation initially is we did a full um, letter drop around the whole of the parish, which was about 600 properties. And we got a 50% return, which is extremely high. Normally you get up to 10%. But that was because we did it with our own volunteers, going on doors and going collecting them as well. So we got a really good database of what the properties were, were like in the area, whether they were well insulated or poor insulated. And on the basis of that, we did a publicity campaign and also got access to um, knowledge about grants that were available. And because we had that information, we could then disseminate that to the people in the area and encourage them to do their own insulation, which they did. Uh, a lot of people did do that. Then we followed it up a couple of years ago with a, a second run to check on the people to see if what they'd done. We found there were still people who knew about it but just hadn't got around to doing it, which is human nature. But because we, we went back to them, a lot of those did them as well. So, and the grants are readily available now. There weren't six or seven years ago. Uh, all this, there were grants there, people just didn't know about them. So we produce, every couple of months, we produce a newsletter on our website which says what grants are available and give typical costs with phone numbers and so on. So people can ring up themselves and find out, which we find is a very efficient way of people finding out how to get their insulation done. So anyone watching this who hasn't done anything about energy saving, the number one thing to do is get your house insulated. That's the first thing, definitely. Insulating and draft proofed. Right. Those are the two things. If you can do that first, then you've got the basics. Because also, uh, some of the grants that you apply for, um, for example, heat pumps and the more sophisticated stuff, um, this is before the feeding tariff came in, they wouldn't give you grants unless your house was properly insulated in the first place anyway. Right. But it's, it's just common sense. It's the cheapest thing to do, and it's the most effective and quickest thing to do as well so it's it just it's just common sense really well we'll put a link through to your website where you can find that yeah, latest yeah. information about grants mm -hmm. and help and so on did you find that, that the people who did insulate the houses are really benefited in terms of cash savings and what's the kind of, sort of savings return you'd get on something like that? well the money you spent when you've had because you've had a grant to do it um, when we first started off you would get that money back in two years okay. now with energy prices going up you get your money back in a year that wow. you spent on it. The money you spent on the insulation. Right. So it's definitely worthwhile. It's worth a, you know, it's worth two or three hundred pounds a year. Gosh. No. Go back a step, really, and just sort of tell us about how this hydro project 
it came about in the first place? Who had the grand vision? Well, well what, what happened? After we uh, addressed the insulation, we said, well, how can we generate electricity um, or generate power which is green? And the obvious thing is you look at your natural resources and you've got solar, you've got wind, and you've got water, basically. And they're there all the time in different quantities, obviously. Well, solar panels at that time, PV panels, were extremely expensive. And they were prohibitively so. You wouldn't get your money back for 80 years or something. So right. that, that went to one side. As we know, everything's changed dramatically. The other was wind, which is the obvious one. Everyone immediately thinks of wind. National Park, big wind turbines, not likely to get approval. We weren't really keen to be involved with great big turbines ourselves uh, on an individual basis. We thought, well, that's not really a go. However, maybe small ones attached to farms or um, small groups of properties might be practical. And so we went and had talks with the National Park planning people about that. And we do have a sort of guidance of uh, where small turbines would be acceptable. In fact, we were involved in the guidance. There's a, a booklet the National Park was out for planning applications, and we were involved um, and advised them on various things that they had in the booklet which were wrong, like a good place to put a wind turbine in front of a wood, which would be nice from a visual point of view, but useless from a wind generation point of view, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So we've worked very into close cooperation with National Park on that. And so the, the guidance notes now are, are, are pretty good. So it is possible to have small wind turbines, but the other one was the river, which is there all the time, running all the time. We thought, well, that would be a good idea. And also we wouldn't have a planning problem with getting planning permission, or at least we didn't think we would. And uh, so that is why we looked at the river. The difference is it's much more expensive to put a hydro turbine in, and we, th we thought it would be much more easy because of the planning. We found out to our cost it's actually much more difficult because we've got to get permission from the environment agency to take the water out of the river, put it through our turbine, put it back in again. You've got to get a license for that. Yeah. And that took us nearly two years to get that. But excuse me if it's a really stupid question, but you don't own any part. Of, none of your volunteers or none of your group no. actually own part of that river. No. It's obviously owned by somebody. Mm. Um, and the land in which you <coughs> were thinking that you could put um, wind turbines on, none of that land is owned by, by you. Your, your group. Not well. by our group. So you're, you're simply, it's in, in, in terms of advising those who do have the land that this is what they could do. No, not quite. Um, with the, with, with the um, hydro turbine, we approached the landowners where the weirs were down the River Esk. Because that's where there's a weir is the obvious place for a hydro turbine. We had a survey done of the whole river catchment right. and it highlighted the best places to put them. And we started off at Castleton looking at the weir then. And we worked our way basically down the river and we ended up at Russet because that's the best weir with the best generation potential, basically. That's why we ended up there. And we spoke to the landowner there and um, he was amenable to enter into agreement with us. So we would lease the land off him for 20 oh, years. Oh, right. So that's where we are. Okay. But so, so that was just one strand of the project. So we had to talk to the environment agency and see whether they were amenable to... Um, anything anywhere on the weir on the river right. and we ended up again at Russell because there's a fish pass already there where there isn't a fish pass the environment agency would have said well if you want to put a hydro in you'll have to put a fish pass in as well which would increase the costs because there was a fish pass already there it seemed an obvious place to do it also had a decent fall on it and we also found a landowner who was amenable so we had to get all these strands together for it to for it to work um, then we had to talk to the fisheries people, the fisheries interests, and they were obviously concerned that the screw would damage the fish. Well, one thing about an Archimedes screw, it is actually recommended by the Environment Agency uh, as a fish-friendly piece of equipment and the kind they would recommend. In the Esk Valley, the Esk River is a salmonoid river, it's an important salmon trout river, right. so that would be Archimedes screw we'd put in there. Right. If we put a normal turbine in, they go at 1500 RPM and chop the fish up. Basically, an Archimedes screw does not do that. It does 80 to 100 RPM, slow moving, and because it's about two and a half meters diameter, that's you know nearly 10 foot diameter, 2.9 it is. Yeah. It's, the screw screws actually hold the water in like a bath. So the weight of the water is pushing the screw round. 
the water isn't moving around. It's, it's difficult to grasp. The water isn't moving around. The water's going down in a, in a block and just comes out the bottom. So it's a fish in. It just sits in this sits water until it gets out the bottom and just swims out. It's not right. getting churned around. Right. So they're very fish friendly. Um, so the Archimedes screw is also very suitable for where the difference in level at the top and the bottom of the weir is not very great and we've only got about two metres. So they're good from that point of view. The disadvantage so is it's not quite huge, expensive. It's two metres. Yeah, it's so only two metres. Right. And and so what what are the sort of the cost implications of, of that? How much would that cost you? To... Well, the hydro turbine is about, I think it's 420,000. That's everything in. Right. But then you've got contingencies and you've got other costs and so on as well. Um, you've got landscaping and all sorts of other costs that are in, involved, the electricity connections, um, all, all those other mm -hmm. ancillaries which, which add up mm -hmm. and put the costs on. With a smaller turbine, with the normal turbine, the, the manufacturer is, is quite different because they're made as a sort of off-the-shelf product and you say, oh, I want one of them, and go and fit it into your, into your river. Yeah. With a, the Archimedes screw is purpose-built for that particular weir. So it's, right. it's bespoke. And because it's bespoke, it's obviously more expensive. And they're manufactured out of heavy metal as well. They're, they're not flimsy things with fantastically tight tolerances, which a normal turbine is. Right, OK. Um, but, um, so you, you've got a, a very robust piece of kit which is going to last a long time, but it is expensive to put in. Right. That's the difference. And what's the electricity generation or something like that? Right? Well, the one we've got is um, 50, it's a 50 kilowatt unit, and it will produce enough electricity for about 55 houses. Really? But that's not just one year, that's for 20 years plus, maybe up to 40 years life. So, you know, this is a long-term project. Right. And the, the thing that drives it forward is we would qualify for a feed-in tariff from the government. Um, well, it's not from the government, it's through the electricity companies, mm -hmm. but it's the government scheme. And that would bring us an income in excess of 40,000 a year. Now, obviously, if we sell lots of shares, we don't have any loans, we're gonna be much, we'll have a surplus each year, which we can use for other projects like insulating people's houses and other mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, if we have to use a lot of loans, then a lot of the money that we bring in will be paying off the loans. Right. Um, but we want to, we've budgeted the whole thing. I mean, this is where we started from. We thought there's a double, double advantage here, that you get the income from the, from the, sorry, you get the green energy, which is the basic first thing. Mm -hmm. So that reduces your carbon footprint. But we'll get the income as well, and that will help other people to do their own thing in their own properties and help them to reduce their carbon footprint. So you get like a double whammy yeah, on it. Yeah. So it's a double advantage. If we have to get lots of loans to do it, that second bit is obviously diminished. And this is why we want to maximise the amount of um, income we can with shares. So yes, that we need to raise £320,000 um, so that we can actually build the turbine. And some of the grant money can use for other purposes. Um, the 320,000, we've raised 115 through shares from the public. Um, we've got another 100,000 in share and loan options that we're negotiating with, which we're hopeful of getting next week, which means we'd still have another 105,000 to raise. Right. The f so the first issue of the shares, um, we got the 115 in, and it came in mainly as a result of our local publicity, but also a big article in the Independence, and the, this, this gave us the exposure. We really need another big exposure to be able to get this extra 105,000 we need. Now, we have a strategy for this. It's fortunate that ethical invest, National Ethical Investment Week starts um, the week after next. And this is a big national thing, and we're uh, very sure that we'll get some publicity on the back of that. And we're also aiming to get some publicity through a national newspaper. Um, if we could get some local TV coverage, that would be even better. And if we can get that, I'm fairly sure we can get this last 105,000 that we need. Right. So that, that's where we're heading. 
Well, I'll put a link through to your website, which um, obviously indicates how you can become a shareholder. Mm, yeah. But if somebody was watching this and thinking, well, I've got some spare cash, um, I'm obviously earning no interest whatsoever mm. in the current economic climate. What's in it for somebody investing in this particular scheme? Well, the main thing is they're doing a useful thing, they're reducing the carbon footprint. They may not be in a position to do that themselves because of the physical layout of the house or whatever. Um, they can't put solar panels up or wind turbines and so on, but this is something they could actually invest in and that would help reduce the carbon footprint because we produce enough energy for 55 houses so we reduce the carbon footprint accordingly, not only for 20 years, but up to 40 years this, this turbine will be going. Right. So, but, so that's the first thing, the feel good feeling, doing something really useful. Secondly, um, they will get a dividend. They won't get anything in the first couple of years, but no one gets any dividend or income at the moment anyway, so that's not really a big problem to establish. But then we are aiming to give 5% in year six now, that's what our target is, to give 5%, which isn't too bad. Um, uh, certainly not compared to nowadays. You yeah. know I mean, you, you look, you can get anything yeah. now. Yeah. So that's not bad at all. And that would be our target, and that's where we would be aiming. And so we, they would get that. And then they, if they needed the money back, if they needed the, um, you know, the, they'd invested £5,000 or whatever it is, they can come along to us and sell the shares back to us and get the money back. Um, so there's those two things there, um, the actual reducing the carbon output um, also getting a dividend for themselves, an interest payment. But the third thing is we would have some surpluses each year, so we will be running um, systems and uh, grants to help people uh, insulate the houses, houses that are very, very difficult to insulate, mm. helping uh, modern apprenticeships people to train in renewable energy and put solar panels up and how to install wind turbines and hydro turbines, obviously. Not many of them about, so they'd have the opportunity to be able to train. We've got colleges who are interested in um, being involved with that. We've already got schools at Russell and in uh, Whitby who have had talks from us and the kids and the, and the teachers are really keen to know more about it and be involved. We'll actually have a, uh, a camera on the site um, so you can go to our website. You'd be able to go on the website, see the turbine turning, and see how much electricity we're producing. Fantastic. So it'd be, it'd be a great tool for the kids. Yeah. We would also we would run uh, organised visits. It's not in public land, so but we would run organised education visits for the children. So they actually see something that's going on, and it would be a, a you know a really really useful tool. And the kids and, and the and the teachers are really up for that, which is which we think is great because you know if we're going to change any of this. We've got to start at the bottom with the kids. The kids mm, are, are, are really interested in this, and that, that's where it should be. Yeah, is there um, is there a minimum investment period that you'd like a shareholder to commit to? Well, the, the minimum investment is two hundred and fifty pounds. Right. You can't, um, and then the maximum is twenty thousand. Um, now, this is laid down by government, uh, the Financial Services Authority. It's a special uh, set of rules for community. Uh, projects. Right. It's not like the normal uh, stock market. Right. And if you buy shares, um, you can't sell them on the stock market. If you want to sell them, you've got to sell them back to us. Right. So it's a, sort of like a closed thing. Um, so it's minimum 250, maximum 20,000. But no matter how much you put in, you only get one vote in, in the organisation. It's a community owned project. Okay. And we chose that system because we didn't want somebody else coming along, buying large amounts of shares, and then taking over and deciding they're going to run right. it for their benefit. Right. You know, it's a not-for-profit organisation for um, in in one terms. Although people do get dividends and so on for it, we didn't want people walking in and trying to take. And, it and, and do they have to keep the money invested for a certain period of years before they could? Sell it back to you, or right? Well, there's a they can't withdraw it within three years, right? Um, okay. I think it's three years, it's in the prospectus, um, and then they can ask for the money back. And uh, the directors will look at how much they can sell, um, buy back right. because the directors have to agree to buy in that money back. So, if everybody in year four wanted to sell their shares back, we couldn't do that, obviously. No. But, but we've budgeted to be able to pay everybody back. In 20 years, 
So that if everybody over a period of 20 years was selling their shares back, we'd be able to buy them back. So we've allowed for that. Right. And the reason we've allowed for that, it means we'd have paid off everything, we'd own the whole project, and that's when the feed-in tariff finishes, and we would then be debt-free, and we could run on for another 20 years, and obviously we'd have the income to spend on whatever we want. If people decide to leave the money in, that's fine. Yeah, uh, It's not a problem. But we've budgeted to be able to get into that situation because if we get to that situation and we're generating decent amounts of money after 20 years and no loans to pay off and no dividends to pay, then we'll be looking to put another hydro turbine up the river. Brilliant. So, so, what's your, so you're looking at towards the end of October is the end of the... The, the, um, the share issue. The, the share the, issue. The closing date is the 28th of October. Assuming yeah. all goes well, you get your 100,000 plus for that and you're there. Mm -hmm. What's your kind of timetable then? Well, then we have to finalise the contract. We have a contract uh, and we have a, an agreed contract with them. Nothing signed, obviously, until we get the money. We have to finalise the contract. And, and once we're happy with that, sign it, say, another few weeks. The order would be placed. They would then arrange for the actual turbine to be made. Now, it takes four or five months to manufacture it. Um, that has to be manufactured and shipped over. This means it would arrive maybe in March, um, March, April. They'd wait till April and uh, gear up to actually install it then when the weather's better. Right. Uh, um, and so we'd actually be looking at generating, I would think, by May. Really that quickly? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, it's different to a normal you know, wind turbine. You can place an order for it and you can have it up in a month. Yeah. Um, solar panels, you can have them up in a week. Uh, this is a, you know, a long-term commitment, and it costs a lot more money, but it's a durable piece of kit, and it's going to go for, you know, we think, up to 40 years. Um, because it's, it's that kind of equipment, you know, solid stuff. But it sounds really exciting. Can we go and have a look at the site? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Quite important we do this. Okay, describe what we're seeing then. Well, the stepped concrete structure is the existing fish pass, and our turbine would actually be at the other side of that. So all you would see is like a small hut halfway along that um, fish pass structure. Uh, there'd be m not much else to see from this side. Um, maybe the people who were taking the boats out for the day could go across and they'd be able to see it. Uh, so it's not obtrusive at all. A couple of the trees will have to come down, but they'll be replanted. Um, so that in a few years it'll be back to how it was. And the white thing, I believe, is a fish monitoring device where the Environment Agency are busy monitoring the fish movements to see how they get up and down and the frequency and so on. And then after we've built the, the uh, turbine, they'll continue monitoring to see if there's been any change in the movement. And you're not expecting any change whatsoever? Not from the turbine, no, not at all. The, the, the really shouldn't make any difference. In fact, the turbine being there and the improved fish pass, well, we think, and so the environment agency agree, they'll actually improve the fish transiting up the river. This is where the outfall for the turbine would be, running into the, the river, the tidal part of the river. And you probably can't see it, but literally just the side of this tree is where the outfall would be next to the fish pass. Is where the boats are. We're expecting a lot of people to be getting the boats and coming and having a road across and having a look at it. So, what will they actually see? Not a vast amount, which is a disappointing one way. Another way is that people think it's quite good, they don't want to see things like this, but we think it's interesting, of course. But it's basically a, a, a screw which is 2.9 metres diameter, and you'd see it if you were on this bank, but this bank is private. And then on the top of it, above the water level, at the boating level, there's sort of like a equivalent of a small garden hut, um, which has the generator in it and some control gear. And that's all you're going to really see. There won't be much else to see, to be honest. And what about the wires sort of linking it up to the, to the, the mains, I presume? Oh, well, fortunately, there's a main cable run to this field behind me, an overhead cable. But we are going to have an underground cable from here to it. 
and then a little substation on the little transformer on the on the post. So there'll be nothing from that point of view. But we're going to have a webcam looking at the um, turbine all the time, showing it generating on our website, and it'll also show how much uh, energy it's generating as well. So it'll be really good to be able to look on that, and particularly schools and educational establishments will be able to log in any time they want and have a look and see how, how they're getting on in dry weather and in wet weather. It'd be, I think it'd be a good facility. Okay. okay, so what are we looking at here? This is the existing fish pass, but it's, they've done a survey of it, the Environment Agency, and it's very badly designed. And it's over-energised, which means that the fish can't actually get up it. And they've watched the fish, and the fish actually go around it. They go up to the water that runs around the outside, or up another pass which is halfway along the weir. Now, as part of our project, this is going to be uh, fully redesigned and refurbished, which will make it much better for the fish to get up. And with the turbine next to it, it means there'll be a strong flow of water at this point, which the fish always seek out the strongest flow of water when walking up the river, and they'll find the bottom of the fish pass, and it will help them to uh, get up past the weir. So the fish are beneficiaries too? Oh yes, indeed. Oh yes, I mean, we've had to convince everybody that that's the case. I mean, it's been important uh, having negotiations with the fish interests in the, in the river, and also National Park and the Environment Agency are very keen on making sure everything's okay as well, as we are. I mean, we live in the valley, we want things to be nice as well. We're not, interested, we're not here as a commercial organisation just trying to take things away. We want things to be good for the future. Okay, Colin, well, I really appreciate you spending so much time explaining it. Now, here's, here's your final <coughs> chance to have a pitch to people who might be thinking at the end of this film, okay, we've got some spare cash, we might put it into this project. Give us your final pitch. Well, it's a really worthwhile project. It's going to produce green energy for up to 40 years, which is great. Reduce the carbon footprint by about 80 tonnes every year. You can invest for as little as £250 or a maximum of £20,000 and buy shares. Of course, if you want to give us a gift, there's no limit to that. So we'd love a big gift. And we're still waiting for another £105,000. So we'd really like you to invest in what is a really worthwhile project. It's the biggest green project in this North York Moors National Park and the biggest green project in the Whitby area. Brilliant project. Thanks Colin, really appreciate it. Not at all.